Uh, so our first pillar that we talked about was, of course, that beautiful old Y4C2Ts. Now, even though the Y4C2Ts is part of the MVVBP, why do we always say that the Y4C2Ts is the foundational pillar of our culture? Why do we say that, somebody? Because it's a commitment as to how we decided to treat each other. I don't have my because notes. it's the predetermined way we are going to treat each other. Now, uh, would one of you real quickly uh, give me a Y4C2T's story? I don't care which letter it relates to. Just give me a great story. I'm waiting. Okay, I'll give one. Cre creativity, uh, ideas before results. So now I have an opportunity, Mo, to redo this in a better way. Um, to give a story would be, for example, if um, the agents are all trying to figure out uh, a way to get a result as far as, um, you know, getting more listings or working with more buyers or working with their team, uh, instead of trying to uh, drive towards the result, what we want to do is to get the ideas and the ideas are going to come from every different type of person. Doesn't matter if they're a red hat, green hat, black hat, yellow hat, negative, positive. We want them all there so that we can all know what we need to do to get to the result. So creativity is the ideas that come collectively uh, from each and every one of us individually before we can actually see the result. Thank you, Chaz. What would I do without you? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope that having a little deeper understanding of the words on the Y4C2Ts, that you all have a new experience with the Y4C2Ts. Anybody had an experience with it since we first talked about it that, that's kind of exciting that you want to share? Boy, it is a struggle to get you people from Florida to talk. <laughs> okay, I'll do it again. Right. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll give everyone time. Uh, the speed of the leader is the speed of the pack, so I'm going to keep talking. Um, okay. So I would I would say that you know I, I've utilized it more more in my recruiting efforts. Uh, in other words, it's now sitting on my desk on a tape. So that when an agent is sitting in front of me from another organization or from another brokerage, before I actually go into the actual four, qua uh, four quads of, you know, the pain and pleasure and deciding if they should fit, I ask them to look at our Y4C2Ts and slow down just a minute and walk them slowly and methodically through each and every one of them and watching their reaction because their reactions are like, whoa, I can't do that or what is this? Think about God family business or why are you feeling that this is important? If they're not buying into our Y4C2Ts, then with what you've taught is that they just may not be the right fit for our culture. Okay. Can you give me a, a specific example of how an individual reacted? Well, the individual reacted very positively. Um, he, was a, he was a new recruit um, that basically came in and it's sitting on my desk and I said, let's go through these one by one to show you what we've committed and what our predetermined commitment is on how we're going to treat one another. And when he went through them, he looked at me and said, oh, my God, he goes, I've never heard of such a thing. I've never heard an organization be so purposeful about uh, what their culture is all about. And I like that. And I uh, know 
Certainly, he hasn't signed yet. I'll just be honest about that because he is supposed to sign this week. But I feel pretty confidently that he is because he keeps coming back. He's come to some of the training. He's had an opportunity to meet with the staff members, with our AL, with our assistant team leader, with our assistant market center administrator, with our PC coach. So he knows what he's getting into. And I believe that this piece here enabled him to understand what he's getting himself into. Well, especially when they're new because um, – they haven't had training and so they don't they don't understand a lot about selling real estate but they do understand about a commitment a predetermined commitment about the way we're going to treat each other now Chaz have you shown it to an experienced agent I have not yet uh, which I will be doing on Tuesday on Tuesday well I'm anxious to hear how that goes so uh, email me and let me know because okay, Mo, I will. you'll become more and more comfortable using it as a re rec recruiting tool. Okay, our second, Mo? Oh. pardon? This is Jackie from the little group. I just wanted to share if you have time where we're kind of having a breakdown um, with this and that like we had a team member um, who quit our team where I felt that we were delivering all of this to her. And when, in her communication back to the market center is like, we weren't doing any of this for her. And that is, was so startling for me. And I mean, I do think if we go back to the very beginning through the CV process, that it was not a good fit, you know, from the very beginning. But I'm really looking now with my team members that I have now are you experiencing this? Like, are you, are you getting this from the team? And if you're not, we need to see, communicate <laughs> where, you know, if you're not getting what you need from us. Well, the, the, what you have to do, if you really want this to be embedded into the heart of your team is you have to tell a story about what somebody did that relates to one of these words because they don't know what it means until they hear the stories. And that means you have to teach your team. Uh, for example, if you were having a team meeting today, then your question would be, what did you experience this week that was win-win for maybe each other or a buyer or a seller? Uh, give us an example of a win-win that you experienced and see if somebody shares something, then you have your story and that can become part of your arsenal of stories. Okay. And uh, maybe uh, maybe it's the question, what did you do this week that shows commitment in all things? What did you do this week that shows that we achieve more as a team than we do individually? You have to keep it front of mind because they won't even know they've experienced it unless they hear these stories and you teach them what it means. Commitment in all things simply means, and then give them two or three examples. It means you go to your child's soccer game if you have committed to it. It means you return phone calls within a certain length of time that you've committed to. It means that you do what you say you're going to do. Now, somebody give me an example where it was kind of hard to do it, but because you're committed in all things, give us an example. And then people will start giving examples and then they'll know they've experienced it. But when you never, ever talk about it, you never, ever tell stories. Sure, they're going to say they've never experienced because they don't even know the words. and They don't even know what they mean. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, let's go to the second one. The MVVBP. 
And let me ask you these questions. And I just love it when you participate. So the, A, the M in MVVBP, can I have MVVBP on the screen? Yes, ma'am, getting that right now. Okay. There we go, MVVBP. What question does the M answer? The M for mission. What question does that answer? The mission, Mo, answers what we do. It says to do, to build a careers worth having business okay. is worth owning so it's what we do it's to do something it's how it shows up in the world what it answers is the purpose of our company it answers the question of purpose why do we exist why are we here what is it we're what is our purpose in having keller williams realty so remember, mission answers the question of purpose. I like it when you say it's to do, because our purpose is to do. That was a great answer, but, but clearly it expresses our purpose to build careers worth having, which means they're profitable, to build businesses worth owning, which means your market centers and your teams are profitable. It means to, to build lives worth living, and that's going to be different for each of us. Experiences worth giving. Ooh, I hope you share those in a team meeting. Because the greater experience you give your customer and client, the greater loyalty you will have. And then, of course, even though you're young, you need to begin to think about the legacies that you want to leave, not only your children, but your grandchildren and maybe your greats, your great grandchildren, the legacy you want your market center to leave, the legacy you want your team to leave. <clears throat> So the M answers the question of what's our purpose. Now, what does the first V, what question does it answer? Vision is what we want to be known for. It answers the question of what is our vision? Well, if we really, really, really do our purpose, then our vision will be to be the real estate company of choice for agents and their customers. But let me tell you what, if we don't build careers worth having and we don't help teams build businesses worth owning, and we don't help our people build lives worth living, and we don't give fabulous experiences to our customers and clients, to our friends and family, and we don't even think about legacies worth leaving, let me tell you, we will not be the company of choice for agents and their customers. Now, we've done a pretty decent job of that because We've had a lot of people choose us, but in the last few years, we've also had a lot of people leave us because so much of this was missing. And when you, when you teach, you talk about this mission and this vision, you will enhance the degree of your loyalty so much. Okay, now what does the second V, what question does it answer? Our values and how we, uh, how we prioritize those different, uh, different things there. 
That's right. It it answers the question, okay, Keller Williams, big deal. So you want to build careers worth having, you want to build businesses worth owning, lives worth living, experiences worth giving, and legacies worth living. Well, so what? What are your values? What's really important to you because you see a value is something that's deeply important to you and and a value is 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 how we're going to treat each other how we treat each other is really important to us how we treat our customers and clients how we treat our friends and our family so there are uh, our values, but our most important stated value is God, family, then business. Now, um, how, how many of you are kind of uncomfortable with that one? And what is it that might make you uncomfortable? I've always had a challenge with this one, Mo. This is Mike Heidorn. Um, you know, because God means different things to different people. And uh, you know, going back old school, you, you don't talk about politics and religion. Yeah, we're taught that we should never talk about politics and religion. But you see, when you say God and family come first and and God simply means whatever your faith is, then that relaxes everybody because you're not cramming a certain religion down their throat. And that's not what we do. What we do is show hospitality to anyone of a different faith. We welcome them, we include them, we appreciate them, we allow them to say their prayer on at Inspirational Morning, at least the five major religions of the world. Uh, we don't have time on Inspirational Morning to include every single religion that ever existed, because there are a lot of them. There are break-offs from different you know, different of the five basic uh, religions. Now, last time I gave you the rest of our values. What do you, but, but my point is, if you say God means whatever your faith is, <clears throat> most people will refer to a higher power as God, but it's whatever your faith is. And uh, I hope that makes you more comfortable using it. Uh, if, if, if you're real uncomfortable with it, then you can say your faith and your family should, should come first and the business second. Now, what do you think about the value that no transaction is worth our reputation? How do you like that one? That's one you wrote down last week. No transaction is worth our reputation. Well, I think it's, it's absolutely it's, true, especially on the recruiting standpoint, because if if your if your brokerage or your agents have a reputation for doing shady deals, nobody's going to want to join you or or be a part of your your uh, office. That's exactly right. What do you think about the, the one that says, we believe profit matters? We're not doing this for charity. I mean, we got we to gotta make a buck. <laughs> I love that. You bet we're not doing it for charity. We're doing it to make a profit. Because if we talk about being a profit sharing company, and then we don't have large profits, we're a fraud. We're absolutely a fraud. Now, what? how do you feel about we believe who you're in business with really matters?
Well, well I mean, it's once huge. Again, it's, oh, go ahead. It's huge, right? Like, I mean, that's the whole uh, the whole reason that I've been you're so drawn to Keller Williams from the very start. I mean, I read the uh, MREI and the MREA before I even joined Keller Williams. And I knew right from that very start, there's only one company I wanted to align myself with. And, you know, going back to our value, God, family, and then business, I share that literally with everyone because it most closely aligns to what I believe, you know, and I, I, I it's funny enough that I say that, but my joke is my wife says I have it backwards because <laughs> I do tend to put business ahead of, every, ahead of everything. family. She wants yeah. family to be for is now. What do you mean you have it backwards? Well, because I'm I'm very very serious about my business, so I just put that first. You know, yeah, but anyway. Okay, I see what you mean. Uh, some of us are workaholics, and we have yeah. to fight against that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, Mo. Yes. I, I, when you make that statement, it reminds me of when I was younger. My mom always used to say, show me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. So that whole concept of who you're doing business with is a reflection of you. Well, I'm here to tell you, as I look at today's market and the, the research I've done in each of them, there's one thing that's lacking in each of our major competitors. And what is it? Many of them have good, have interesting business models. I don't think they're as good as ours. But what is the one thing that's lacking in every single major competitor? Culture. The four pillars of the culture. And let me tell you, when we drop those pillars of the culture, then we become just like everybody else. We're just a company with some words on a wall and nobody knows what they are and they don't know what they mean. And we don't hold each other accountable to live the best we can by our four pillars, the Y4C2Ts, the MVVBP. And now today we're gonna go to the third pillar, which is the six personal perspectives. Now, the six personal perspectives is very, very important because Keller Williams took the time to do the research to find out what things were common in every high producer. What do all high achievers have in common? And, and we found out what they were. And to this day, if you were to study all of our high achievers, you would find out that they are committed to self-mastery. They're committed to the 80-20 principle, E to P, to be learning-based and remove their limiting beliefs, and most importantly, be accountable. Now, that is really fascinating that all high producers, whether they're in real estate, whether they're in the stock brokerage business, or whether they're moms at raising kids at home, or a dad in a business, the ones that are really successful have all six of these traits within them. Now, in every single market center, this class, because the six personal perspectives is actually a class, and it's to be taught in, this, in your market center at least once a week. And it doesn't matter if one person comes to the class or a hundred people come to the class. The point is, it's being taught. 
Now, who should teach it? Well, of course, the team leader, the assistant team leader, maybe the productivity coach. But what is really wonderful is when there are people within the market center or within the ALC that are committed to this pillar to the point that they learn how to teach it. And so my question to Chaz is this, how many different people are teaching the six personal perspectives in, in, in the market center? Sadly to say, Mo, we don't have it taught in our market center right now. And why is that? Because we have not collectively come together as a leadership team to make sure that it does happen. And going forward, we will. And how do you expect new people to learn what these attributes are these six common attributes are among high achievers when you don't teach it. That's exactly correct. And, um, and it should always be on the calendar because I'm here to tell you, you don't learn them all in just one time. You have to go to this class three or four times to really get them all. Because the first time I attended it, I got a real good concept of, of self-mastery. But I, I didn't really clearly understand the 80-20 principle because I was struggling to figure out what my 20% was because you'll learn that 20% of what you do creates 80% of your income. And then this thing of moving from E to P, I, I probably went to the class five times to get that. You can call me slow <laughs> if you want to, but that one was a brand new concept to me. Now, how in the world do we expect our people to work on these six things if they don't clearly understand what they are? Because you, this is a lifelong trip to really develop self-mastery. And, and we've learned through the research that if you de develop self-mastery in maybe losing weight, it can transfer over to self-mastery in doing scripts on uh, calls to your warm leads, where you're so good at that, it's incredible. Or, or giving a listing presentation. And what they've taught us is that once you develop the discipline to master something, it transfers over to the next thing, but you can only master one thing at a time. That's why you don't ever quit going to this class. And that's why those of you who are dead serious about being a high achiever, that's why you learn to teach the class. Because how do you really learn? You learn by teaching. Teaching. That's how you learn. If you're not any good in giving a listing presentation, then what do you want to teach? Giving a listing presentation. And if you're not really good in for sale by owners, what do you want to teach? FISBOs. And if you're not really good in moving from being entrepreneurial to being purposeful, what do you want to teach? The E to P, the six personal perspectives. <laughs> That's right. So I'm hoping the leadership in your South Florida region will absolutely hold you team leaders 
you ALC members accountable to get serious about the third pillar of the culture. Because the third pillar of the culture is what will, is the very thing that will make your own business profitable. Mo, I have a question. Yes. So when you mention that this ideally is taught regularly, and then you say, hey, we should be teaching this, I have a, a couple of curiosities about it. So one of the things I know is that Gary used to break down the, the six personal perspectives and lead portions of them prior to every other training he used to lead. And, um, and so when you say it should be in the market center on a weekly basis, while we do have it offered regionally quarterly as a full like class, are you referring to having portions of it delivered prior to a team meeting? Yes, because you, you can do it any way you want to in a market center, but the point is you have tons of brand new people coming in every day and how in the world do you expect them to learn it if you don't teach it okay yeah that makes sense to me because i i the brand new people have never heard of the six personal perspectives i don't care if they're a multi-million dollar producer or they're a brand new person they have never heard of it before yeah. No. And that's on uh, when you're recruiting someone that should be on your expectations list that they go to the classes that teach the four pillars of our culture that these should be taught all the time and talked about at every meeting. See, we used to do that, you know, what Gary did at the beginning of each class we had one of the personal perspectives being taught and we quit. And we haven't done it for years. And look what's happened. Yeah, I think it gets missed because, it, you know, it used to be a full day and or it broken down into team meetings. I remember earlier in my career that I, that's how it was done. And I leave Quantum Leap. And it's, it's in that course, but most people don't know the six personal perspectives as the six personal perspectives, because like you said, they're not being delivered regularly and consistently. That's and right. I think that's an opportunity. Yeah, Mo, can I add to that? Um, this is Melissa DeMaria, I'm in Tampa. Um, and I had the opportunity to teach six personal perspectives in my market center this year. And we did not have a great turnout. However, we had three people. One was an agent that had been there almost 20 years. So she knew, right, the, the six personal perspectives. One had been there about a year and one was brand new to the company. The ahas and the um, it, just the work that was done and the, the perspective that the agent that had been there a long time and the brand new agent got were so powerful. And I think to your point, right, we don't bring it up enough, but they all, three people, but it was a fantastic day. And they all left with action items and things to do. So I do, uh, I do think that we forget because if we've been around for a while, we, we think we know it. Well, that's what happens is you teach it and you, you pretty much get everybody um, knowledgeable about it. And then boom, all these new people come flooding in and they don't have a clue. And um, then that's the beginning of losing your culture because, you know, like in our teams, uh, they don't talk about it in their teams. Uh, you know, the questions are so simple. Hey, what is it you're working on? what is it you're trying to develop self-mastery? Is it something personal, like you're going to stop smoking, or is, is it something in your business life? Just share with us what you're working on, and tell us what you do, because it'll help us. It'll help all of us. Um, are you developing self-mastery in building a team? Have you studied the seven levels to the point you know exactly what comes next? 
I, I mean, are you master? Are you developing self mastery and dealing with your teenager? Are you developing self mastery in learning to listen? You know, I, do do you get it? I mean, there every area of your life, <laughs> there are so many areas to develop self mastery that is sometimes over overwhelming. And, and just having people share, what's your 20%? Well, we know what it is for an agent. It's lead generation. We know what it is for a team leader. It's recruiting. Um, and just having people share what their top, what their 20% is. How did finding agents in your market center that have moved from doing maybe 5 million in volume to 20 million in volume. What did they do? And having them share, what did they do to, to break that ceiling of achievement and move from five to 20 or five to 15 or five to 10, whatever the number is. And see if you, You've got stuff to talk about at team meetings and at, at training classes from now till the day you die. You can never talk too much about this stuff. You've got four pillars to talk about. <clears throat> what limiting belief are you working on? You know, for years, my limiting belief was I can't teach good like Gary. I felt inferior to Gary and I would not teach quantum leap. It was, I bet 10 years went by when I was with the company and I wouldn't teach it because see, he can go off on these bunny trails and the bunny trails are so interesting and so fascinating. I can't do that. I'm not Gary, duh. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just absolutely not him, so I can't do his beautiful, wonderful bunny trails. But I'm Mo, and I can stick most of the time, you know, to whatever's in the book. <laughs> so, see, we each have our own talent and our own ability, but my limiting belief was I was so inferior to him because he's so intelligent and he's way up here and it takes me a while to process things. See, I'm a, I'm a mover and a shaker and a doer. If, if Gary will just tell me what he wants to accomplish, then it pops into my head the steps to do it. That just comes to me. I don't even have to think about it. And so the, the good Lord's given me the ability to know what the steps are, but that he's given Gary the ability to know what the big picture is. And that's why we were such a good team is because, because he would speak it and I would go to work to make it happen. And so we're all different, but when we share with each other how we're working about our limiting beliefs, what happened with Gary is he came in my office one day and he said, you're going to teach quantum leap. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and then the Pennsylvania region invited me to teach quantum leap. And I went there in terror and shaking in my knees, but I made it through that first time. And that gave me a teeny bit of confidence. And then I made it through the second time and I was a whole lot better. And then I had a little more confidence and I made it through the third time and I was even better. Because see, I started focusing on what I could do and not what Gary Keller could do. And so that's why on all of these pillars and all of these points, you want to get your ALC to pick what they want to train. And it should be their weakness. And if you can get other agents in the market center who maybe are interested in the educational committee, 
then see, you'll have, you'll have your market center trainers, but you've got to listen to them and, you know, approve them and make sure they're really good. But most real estate agents are really good in training. A lot of them are very, very good. It's just that they get busy and they don't think they have time to do it when in fact it makes them even better. All right, now the goal of pillar three is to absolutely um, get this going in your market center and you train it however you want. You could do one each week and it would take you six weeks to get to finish and then you start all over because you've got new people coming and that's part of their orientation or it's part of their onboarding you you they don't have a choice they they come to that or they're not a match <coughs> Uh, you know, like new people, it's Ignite, it's eventually bold after they do so many transactions, uh, whatever your standard is, and it's the six personal perspectives, and, um, and you spell it out in your, in your orientation or your onboarding, and then whoever's coming on board with you you have your list of expectations. I expect you to be at the team meeting. And if they're not there, you call them up, team leaders, and say, where are you? You hold them accountable to the expectations. All right, now, uh, what are some of your ahas from having touched on the six perspectives. Hey, Mo, it's Howard. It's Howard. Um, what I would say is this. Um, we do actually in our Ubaldini Market Centers have it offered through FES. We do offer it a couple times, probably two to three times a year. What we don't do purposefully enough is what Xavier brought up, which is make it inherent in everything that's taught in there. Like it needs to be a part of Ignite. It needs to be a part of our Jumpstart program. It needs to be brought up. You know, it's kind of like when we're launching Bold, we bring something from everything in training from Bold into the training. <clears throat> I think we need to be more self-accountable to make sure all the training that happens includes it as well. It doesn't even have to be at the beginning. It could be shown throughout. However, what it's telling me as a leader is uh, going back to train the presenter and training our trainers on how to bring things from other courses into that course in a natural and organic way, if that makes sense. Well, that's a really good point because train the trainer is another thing that should be going on in the market center at least once a month. Because as a team leader, you're going to spot your potential trainers you're going to feature your ALC members. And it's so easy to do that because one of them will be really good in maybe selling luxury homes. And so you showcase them at a team meeting. I want to showcase Tom because he is a luxury specialist. And you ask him one question. Tom, what is the one thing you do that makes you so good? And Tom will end up telling you two or three things that makes him or her so good. And then you look at the audience and you say, here is your chance to ask Tom anything you want to ask him about selling luxury homes. It's that simple. Well, and I think and, it's the same. It's the same aha uh -huh I have each of these each of these calls that you've, you're doing with us. I think what's happening that this isn't an excuse or, or a rationale. The velocity of the market that we're in right now has pushed a lot of this aside, and it can't. It's got to become that much more important because we're preparing for what's to come, and it also 
again, it's our biggest differential as a company. It always has been, always will be. Well, it, it always will be if we talk about it and 100%. we train on it, right. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> um, and see, when you watch Tom respond to the audience and answer the questions, you're going to know whether or not you're, you're going to encourage him to take train the trainer. And if, if he's wonderful in, in luxury, then encourage him to teach a luxury class. Do you think those agents would love to be in his class because he's so good at luxury? Well, it would be an honor to be able to sit under his tutelage. And I, I have seen um, whatever the ALC member is really good at. Maybe they're they've been great in moving from E to P and see having them teach what they did to move from E to P and teach the E to P concept makes them think about what, what they did. And it gives specific things that agents can do. It's, it's so simple. It's so simple if you'll showcase people at a team meeting and you get a feel for how they respond in, um, in talking to people. Okay. Hey, Mo, Mo, Jan has a question for us. Raise your hand. Yes. Mo? Yes. The aha I took was specifically towards the teams that we have not the market center, but the teams that work. We have some extraordinary teams in our market center. And I think if we reached out to the people in that team, because sometimes they are so busy, but there's got to be a way for them to come together at their weekly or sometimes daily meetings that even one personal perspective could be taught to the whole team, including the person at the top. That's and I right. think that would, be, that would be something to reach out for. That's exactly right. And teams tend to isolate themselves from the market center because they do get so busy. And when there's somebody in the market center who wants to teach them the six personal perspectives, many times you know, maybe one at a time, many times the team leader is so relieved and so happy that someone's willing to pour into their team uh, that it turns out to create even more loyalty between the team and the market center because they understand that the staff at the market center wants to help their team. I'm seeing that happen in a market center that I have helped resurrect after a, a rough patch. <clears throat> and the team leaders are just so grateful. Okay, anything else? Yeah, for me, I'm committing to learning how to teach six personal perspectives in my market center. My that outfit. would be awesome. Yay. That is just awesome because the six personal perspectives had a huge influence on my own life years ago when, when Gary and Dave first taught it to me. I, I was blown away with what I learned and um, it can have the same effect on everybody else as well as, as, as what we experienced. Any, anything else? Mo, I like the, the, the fact that you mentioned that what differentiates our brokerage from other brokerages are the four pillars. And that is the determining factor that separates us. And I never knew that until you brought it up that way, um, that those are, that, that is the differentiator, our four pillars is what differentiates us from our competitors. That was it my really, It really is. And although um, 
you know, I think our economic models a whole lot better than EXP's, but EXP has an economic model that's kind of fascinating to people. And it's different than ours. And if you really do the analysis, um, you would never, I don't think you would ever leave profit share. It, the problem is we don't teach profit share enough in the market center that people get the vision and realize they can make thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars <coughs> from profit share. Um, but these other companies have no culture. They don't teach it. They don't talk about it. They don't meet together, uh, if at all, very often. They don't have camaraderie. They don't have the components of the culture that make us powerful. And it's the secret sauce. And, and, and when we started losing a lot of people, I'm telling you, it was because our culture was highly neglected by the leadership of our company. We had a period and a series of CEOs that did not give it the time and attention it demanded, and it has to have to be sustaining. And Carl came along, and Carl got it, and now he is really adamant that we have mission moments. And, and people tell all sorts of stories during the mission moments, and that's great. <clears throat> uh, if I were doing it, I would say I want a mission moment in a career worth having, because that's part of our mission. I want a mission moment in somebody telling a, a story of a life worth living or an experience worth giving or a legacy worth leading. And the reason I would do that is because it, it helps people understand the mission more clearly. But I'm so proud of Carl because as the new CEO of the holding company, he really gets the importance of the culture. And he, he so wants our company to be one company. And the only way it's ever gonna become truly one company is when people grasp the Y4C two T's, one of the T's where it says, together everyone achieves more. And when they begin to see the mortgage company as a part of KWRI, when they begin to see as Keller covered and on the insurance and all this stuff we've got, how it can be an advantage to every single customer, to every single client, and we become cohesive through the power of the culture, will we ever become that one company that Carl so desires, but he gets it. And we, and we became so consumed with being a technology company that we all kind of forgot our culture. And boy, have we paid a price. We've lost thousands of agents across the United States because our culture was diminished in each market center. And we just, Gary teaches us all the time to go back to the basics in listing and selling. Well, guess what? You go back to the basics in culture because what he taught us in the very beginning is the secret sauce that made us special. And when you do the analysis of the surveys, people come to this cult company for the culture. Almost everybody you ask say, you know what? There was just something about it that was different. Well, it's the culture.
duh. Now, uh, would you put up the, the last pillar of the culture and do a culture in action? Just one sheet of it is fine. I want everybody to see what we're going to cover in our last meeting. So can you get that up for me? Yes, ma'am. I'm doing it right now. Thank you. Here we go, culture in action. This piece was, was created by basically Kay Evans and myself and some top team leaders and some top agents. And it's kind of evolved through the years. It's long and I don't expect anybody to memorize it, heavens no. But I do expect team leaders to talk about one or two things on it, each team meeting, because this teaches agents what a culturized office looks like. When they come from traditional offices, they don't have a clue what a culturized, culturized office looks like. And this teaches us what it really looks like. And there are two parts to it. The first part is behavior, the standards for how we behave. <clears throat> and then the second part are the standards for what we do. The standards for what we do. So it's behavior, and it's what we do. And we're gonna go over these quickly in our last meeting. And I want you to think about how you're gonna create a picture for your market center all the time to see if the market center fits this picture because this is the picture of a culturized market center. I love you all. I thank you for being on the call. I thank you for caring about the culture. You make my heart sing because you care or you wouldn't be on this, you wouldn't be on this call. So God bless you. Have a good rest of the week and know how much I care about you and how much I love you. Bye. We love you, Mo. Bye, Mo. Thank you. Love you, Mo.